Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We begin and we finish the book of Haggai today. It's only two chapters. The Old Testament book of Haggai. If you are able, open your Bible up to the book of Haggai, and I'll give you a minute or two to do that. And while you're doing that, I will tell you about the scripture verse by verse website that can be found at the Bible verse by verse dot com. The scripture verse by verse website is available for you to use at your convenience, at your pace to study the entire Bible verse by verse from Genesis through Revelation. Just click on the book you want to study, click on the chapter, open your Bible, follow along, and study as I teach it verse by verse. I'll mention it again at the end of the broadcast, but one more time, it is found at the Bible verse by verse dot com. I hope you can stick with me now for the next 30 minutes or so as we continue our verse by verse study through the Bible. Haggai chapter 1 verse 1. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. In the second year of Darius, the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month. Let's just stop there for a second. As we come to this book of the Bible, the Israelite exiles had returned to Jerusalem, about 50,000 of them anyway. And they, they did begin to rebuild the temple. But when they were given a hard time by the Samaritans who were in the land, they stopped building the temple. And a few years later, they started to prosper. And as a, as a result, they grew indifferent to that rebuilding project. It, they didn't even think about it anymore. And that actually went on for 16 years. They were indifferent toward the house of God. And that's when God called Haggai to go and rebuke his people. And so it says that the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Josh, jo, excuse me, Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying. And so the year is 520 B.C. And God has a message for the leadership who had returned to Jerusalem after the exile. What is that message? Verse 2. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. And so the people's excuse for not rebuilding the holy temple was that the time wasn't right. And of course, that was a pitiful excuse. That should have been top priority. They should have battled through the opposition and done what they were supposed to have done. But it was an excuse to cover their spiritual indifference. Verse 3, Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Well, you know, they, they thought it was time for them to build nice houses for themselves, and they ought to be ashamed of themselves. They were living in luxury for that day and age, in nice homes, while the temple was still in ruins. 
Well, what were they waiting for? Verse 5. Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. This is a wake-up call. And God is saying, you better look at your behavior and consider how God views it and quit offering lame and pious-sounding excuses for your wrong priorities. Verse 6, Ye have sown much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages earneth wages to put into a bag with holes. And so God was trying to get their attention, clearly. And he is and, and he's saying, after trying to get their attention, he's saying, Haven't you wondered why nothing seems to be going right for you? All these strange and unusual occurrences kind of always setting you back from where you should be. Nothing ever seems to work out. Did you ever wonder about that? God says, I'm trying to show you that I'm not pleased. I'm trying to get your attention. Verse 7. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. In other words, it's time to examine your conscience and do it in light of my word because you know from my word what I have told you that I want you to do. You better measure yourself by my word and see how you are behaving compared to how I want you to behave. Verse 8. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house and I will take pleasure in it and I will be glorified saith the Lord in other words if you do what is right if you do what I want you to do if you stop thinking about yourself and start building my house then I will be honored and God says, I will not only be honored, but you know what happens when I'm honored. Then I'm pleased. And you're going to be blessed. Things will change. Verse 9, Ye looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why? saith the Lord of hosts. Because of mine house that is waste. And ye run every man unto his own house. In other words, you people are selfish. You're putting yourself before me, your God. And of course, they wouldn't even be in that land if it wasn't for God. They wouldn't have the ability to work or to build anything if it wasn't for God. And God says, that's why I'm causing your expectations to fail. 10. Therefore, the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. God says it's your fault that you don't have enough rain. God turned off the heavenly sprinklers. He's trying to get their attention. Things are not going well. 11. And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of the hands. God says, I'm withholding blessings because you have been withholding from me the honor that I deserve. You haven't been putting me first. You've put me on the back burner, actually, and you have completely forgotten about me. 
You're so busy doing things for yourself. You're not even thinking about my holy temple and the worship that you should be doing there. You get that until you get that right. Nothing is going to be right. And until we put God first in our lives, nothing is going to be right. You say, well, I've been putting God first and I don't have everything that I want. Well, God never promised you everything that you want. But he has promised you blessings and peace and joy that comes from walking with him if you don't have an agenda. Look, our agenda needs to be God's agenda. You know what that means? Whatever you want, God. Whatever you want for me, whatever you don't want for me, I'm going to trust you. And sometimes that's hard. But that's, that is submitting to God's agenda. And I know some people don't like to hear that. Some Christians get absolutely furious at me when I say those sorts of things, but it's the truth. So God says, I'm withholding blessings because you have not put me first. Verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatil, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. So the people heard God's word, and they repented. They heard the word of God, and they repented. See, that's the importance of giving people the word of God. Because the tendency of human beings in this sinful world is to backslide is to fall away from God. We need to be jolted back into spiritual reality by getting into the Word of God. It keeps us on the straight and narrow path. So the people here, they heard God's Word, and as a result, they repented. See, everyone slips into sin. The important thing is to admit it when God shows you what you have done and repent. And it is so much easier for the God to get our attention when we are in his holy word. Verse 13, Then spake Haggai the Lord's messenger in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. When, when they showed proof of their repentance, when it was more than just talk, God accepted it, and things reverted back to normal. Verse 14, and the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatil, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. And so their repentance was seen when they began to build God's temple again. Repentance isn't just a change of mind. I know that's a very fashionable definition today among evangelicals, but that's not repentance. Repentance isn't just talk. It is acting the right way. It is doing the right thing. That's how you show that your repentance is real. It's like John the Baptist said, bring forth fruit, therefore, that is fit for repentance. Otherwise, you haven't repented, no matter how many times you've said that you did. Verse 15. In the four and twentieth day of the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. So they changed their ways, and they did it on September 21st, 520 B.C. Now let's go into chapter 2. In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, So God speaks to this prophet Haggai on October 17th. So, a little less than a month after they changed their ways. Verse 2, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheotil, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house 
in her first glory. And how do ye see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? So some of the older people who were alive 70 years earlier and remember the former temple before Babylon destroyed it, were saying this new temple isn't anywhere as nice as the old one that we used to have. Boy, the good old days, you know, they were a lot better than today. Verse 4, Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. God will help them finish what they started because it was his will for them to do it. Verse 5. According to the word that I covenanted with you when ye came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. And so by helping his people, God is fulfilling a promise he made to them 800 years earlier. God never forgets a promise. Verse 6, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. Hebrews chapter, chapter 12, verses 26 and 27 quotes this verse in connection with the judgment of the world at the second coming of Christ. So now you know what he's talking about right here. The Bible interprets itself, by the way. That's the importance of studying and reading the entire Bible, verse by verse, from Genesis through Revelation. That's why I, I have been teaching it that way for 30 years now, over 30 years, because Scripture interprets Scripture. And you're not going to get out of balance, and you're not going to have all sorts of strange and weird doctrines if you study and teach the Bible from Genesis through Revelation, every verse. Verse 7. And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The desire of all nations refers to the Messiah, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, what God is saying is that this temple may not be much to look at right now, but one day my son is coming, and that's going to make this a special place. And at his first coming, it was a special place because Jesus went there. He went there as a young boy, and he asked questions, and he taught the elders sitting in the temple at age 12. Later on, he came to the temple, and he taught the people. Lots of good things happened in that temple when Jesus was around. And then it says in verse 8, God says, The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. God could fill this temple, or for that matter, any other home, with all sorts of valuables if he wanted to do it, because it all belongs to him. All the gold, all the silver, all the money belongs to Almighty God. He is the supreme, divine, all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present banker. Verse 9. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. This second temple was a type of the church of Jesus Christ. The first temple was a type of the Jewish religion. And so God is saying, the work that my son is going to accomplish on the cross is going to far outweigh any work done in these temples. Verse 10. In the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying. So about two months later, Haggai receives another message from God. 11. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priest concerning the law, saying, if one bear holy flesh, 
in the skirt of his garment, and with his skirt do touch bread or pottage or wine or oil or any meat, shall it be holy? And the priest answered and said, No. Consecrated meat was meat that had been offered to God as a sacrifice. Consecrated meat was holy, but it could not transfer its holiness to other food by physical contact. That's not all holiness is transferred. Verse 13, Then said Haggai, If one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these, shall it be unclean? And the priest answered and said, It shall be unclean. And so the flip side is true. If a person who was ceremonially unclean touched holy meat, then according to the Old Testament law, the meat would no longer be holy. The point is this. Uncleanness is transferred a lot easier than holiness. Verse 14. Then answered Haggai and said, and said, So is this people. And so is this nation before me, saith the Lord. And so is every work of their hands. And that which they offer there is unclean. The Israelites were back in the Holy Land. But just as regular food wasn't made holy by simply touching holy food, they, the Israelites, were not made holy just because they touched holy ground. The only way to become holy is to consecrate yourself to the Lord. Verse 15. And now I pray you, consider from this day and upward, from before a stone was laid upon a stone in the temple of the Lord. He's saying, before you build one stone upon another in this temple, think about what I have said and what I'm about to say. Verse 16. Since those days were, when one came to an heap of twenty measures, there were but ten. When one came to the press vat, for to draw out fifty vessels of the press, there were but twenty. In other words, you haven't had a lot of produce, have you? God is saying. Your harvest really haven't been very good, have they? Verse 17. I smote you with blasting. And, and blasting would be plant diseases, various kinds. He says, he says, I smote you with blasting and with mildew and with hail in all the labors of your hands. Yet ye turn not to me, saith the Lord. In, in the past days, God tried to get through to his people. He sent bad weather. But the people had not caught on to the fact that God wasn't pleased with them. Verse 18. Consider now from this day and upward, from the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, even from, from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. God is saying, think about this. From the time you came back to the Holy Land and started to lay the foundation of the temple until now, I have not blessed you much. And that was because their hearts had not been fully devoted to the Lord. 19. Is the seed yet in the barn? Yea, as yet the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree hath not brought forth from this day will I bless you. So, the consequences of their former lukewarmness towards God were still with them. But things would start changing for the better. And that's because they were changing for the better. 
God responds to true repentance, which shows itself in a turning from sin and a turning to good works. Verse 20. And again, the word of the Lord came unto Haggai in the four and twentieth day of the month, saying, this was the second revelation given on that same day. Verse 21. Speak to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth, and I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms, and I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen, and I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them, and the horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. God promises to overthrow all the forces of evil that are opposed to the church of Jesus Christ. The gates of hell, the Bible says, shall not prevail against my church. Verse 23, In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, will I take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Sheotil, saith the Lord, and will make thee as a signet, for I have chosen thee, saith the Lord of hosts. Zerubbabel was a member of David's royal line, and therefore Zerubbabel is spoken of here in the sense that he is a type of the coming Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the fulfillment of this prophecy that is mentioned towards Zerubbabel is actually found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, the son of David, and the descendant of Zerubbabel, Jesus will establish the kingdom of God when he establishes the church, which is what he did on the day of Pentecost. And that kingdom is going to last forever. That kingdom of God, with Jesus Christ as the king, began on the day of Pentecost when the gospel was preached and souls were saved through Jesus Christ and that kingdom has been expanding for over 2,000 years because wherever the king is, that is where his kingdom is and it's on earth and it's over the whole world and someday when Jesus returns the kingdom of God with Jesus as king, of course, because it's going to last forever, will take on a different mode. But salvation is still only through Christ. It's just that Jesus will be on earth, ruling and reigning from his literal throne in the literal city of Jerusalem. It'll no longer simply be a spiritual kingdom, but it will be a physical kingdom. And that's what he's talking about here. And that's what we have to look forward to. And if you want to study the Word of God further, let me remind you that that is what the Scripture Verse by Verse website exists for, for you to study the Word of God. You can study the whole Bible verse by verse from Genesis through Revelation using my audio Bible commentaries. Again, as I said at the beginning of the broadcast, just click on the book that you want to study Click on the chapter, open your Bible, follow along, and listen as I teach it verse by verse from Genesis through Revelation. And if the Word of God blesses you, please remember that I am brought to you by your prayers and your financial support. Mm -hmm. I have never taken a salary in 30 years of doing this. This is a faith ministry from start to finish, and it always will be that way. I depend again, on your prayers and the financial support of God's people who are blessed by His Word. And you can give in a secure method at our website found at thebibleversebyverse.com. You can give, just click the donate button at the top of the front page and give as the Lord may lead. My time is up right now, but we'll be back and we'll start a new book of the Bible next time. And that would be the book of Zechariah. I hope you can join me. Until then, Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.